And I did a presentation at a small like undergraduate conference a lot like this uh, when I was, uh, it was like 10 years ago, when I was like 21, and it was uh, totally critical in me kind of becoming an academic because I, uh, I, was, uh, I was worried about presenting research I was doing. I was worried my research was still very, you know, immature and stuff. And then I went and I saw, oh, it's, you know, it's not so hard, it's not so bad, it's actually, uh, people actually liked it, and, and it was great. And actually, it's good. I also went to one of these to support friends of mine, too, who were presenting and give them the old smile and the nod while they're presenting it, and that went well. So uh, definitely do this if you have the slightest interest, because it'll pay off. And it definitely, definitely looks good on a resume uh, later, so that's, that's a good reason, too. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, go ahead and continue to pass that out if you want, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, a couple things I want to announce before class. Uh, we took the exam. Uh, 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 briefly looking at some of the exams, looks like you all did very well. Uh, so those of you who did great on the exam, that you kicked ass, you can sort of say, oh my god, I'm on a roll, I'm kicking ass, I'm so motivated to continue to kick ass in this class. And those of you who don't, didn't perform as well as you wanted to, you probably already know, you know, from just taking it, and you gotta, you know, now you gotta say, okay, well this was some sort of strange mistake, something weird happened last week, and now I will resume kicking ass in this class. So regardless of what you did, be motivated, uh, attend class, and, uh, and, and continue to kick ass. Uh, a second thing, I, I would like to reiterate my announcement from uh, last week. I can't talk to people before class really because I have to set up stuff here and I don't want to be rude to you uh, when you come up. So if I'm, if I'm curt with you, I apologize, but I just can't even talk before class. But I can talk to you at the break or after class if you have little things you need to talk to me about. Uh, oh, another thing, uh, we went through the breaching videos. We actually got some breaching videos, about like 15 or so. And these, which means Nora wins the bet on how many breaching videos we were going to get. Congratulations, Nora. Kristen, I owe you $5, just so you know. Uh, I totally overestimated how many videos we were going to get. Um, uh, but the videos were really fun. They were really cool. Uh, I haven't, we haven't gotten the full reports back on the on-paper breaches, which all of you did. Shh. We haven't got the full reports back on those. Uh, probably on Tuesday, I'll give you some kind of report on what the funniest ones were that we got, or the most outrageous, or the most blatantly violating my dictum that you'd not do anything illegal or immoral, uh, which several, several did. Thanks a lot for that. And, uh, uh, but uh, amongst the video awards, or the, sorry, the video, the video breaches, they were very fun, and we have a first annual Sociology 150A award for best video breach, which goes to Nathan Menard. That's you, Nathan. Can you please stand up really quick? Yeah. And Nathan, you receive, as an award, the first season of the Ollie G Show, my own personal, <laughs> personal copy. Um, sorry about that. It's not scratched, I promise. Uh, I, uh, I would never scratch that. So congratulations. Nathan's uh, video breach was a, a stunning work of art and comedy. Uh, it had a, even had a cool title, like bringing comedy to the economy. And uh, the whole thing was like set to music and involved him uh, breaching in public spaces and specifically like invading people's public space in grocery stores and just sort of generally acting very creepy around uh, various stores. <laughs> in Berkeley, uh, incredibly amusing, and I, I, I really appreciated it. Uh, I watched it again last night, just for fun. Um, yeah, so that was cool, I actually enjoyed it, it was fun, it was actually like entertainment that I continued to watch again and again. Okay, so now I'm getting to be the creepy one, right? So, <laughs> okay, so we've wrapped uh, several parts of the class. We started off with cognitive biases, and then we, can you all be quiet there? You, thank you. Uh, we started off the class with cognitive biases, and then we went up to a more social level of analysis, to conformity processes, and now we're kind of still going up to obedience to authority. Now, why do I say this is up higher than cognitive biases were or conformity was? Well, cognitive biases are sort of intra-individual processes, right? It's stuff that happens in your head. It has to do with how you perceive other people, but it's all sort of stuff that happens in your head. The phenomena is in your head. Con conformity is something that happens between people. It has to do, again, with your mental processes, but it's very much a between people thing. When we run experiments on conformity, multiple people show up at these experiments. Um, now next, I say it's a higher level of analysis talking about obedience to authority. Why? Because obedience to authority intrinsically involves uh, an authority uh, giving directives 
to a subordinate. And so it therefore involves uh, multiple levels of hierarchy, perhaps in an organization. Okay, so obedience. What is obedience? Obedience is defined as compliance with the directives or orders of an authority. And now those of you who have taken, you've all taken an exam in here now, and so you know that these little definitions are worth catching. <clears throat> What are examples of obedience to authority? Soldiers taking orders in, in the army or some, some other setting. Employees doing whatever their boss tells them to, tells them to do. Uh, students doing assignments and so on. You're all of you obeying authority right now. Um, and a big example of research on obedience to authority is Stanley Milgram's obedience experiments. Uh, and how many of you have seen the Milgram experiment? Okay, and then you've all seen the replication that we showed a couple weeks ago. And so we're not going to go through the Milgram experiments in that much detail. We're certainly not going to watch the film again because I can get away with just having counted on you already watching it in another class. Uh, but one thing I want to note, well, we will talk about it in some detail later in the lecture. One thing I want to note is they're not technically experiments. Why are they not experiments? Because he ran uh, one setup, you know, under a certain set of conditions, and then he looked at what the results were of that setup, and then he said, oh, I'm going to change one of these conditions and run the study again. And then we had to change one of the conditions and then run the study again and then so on. And so he ran a series of essentially baking soda volcano type demonstrations. What was he missing? What was he missing that would have made it an experiment? Let's say he'd run all the conditions at the same time. What would have been the big difference between what he did uh, and running them all at the same time? Okay, all right, that was a tough freaking question. Nobody knows, 460 people completely stumped. Uh, the big difference would be random assignment to conditions. Random assignment to conditions is something we do in order to randomize away individual differences so we don't have to worry about individual differences driving our results. Instead, we can be sure that our manipulations drive our results. So if you run a series of conditions across time, you might worry that the people that were in the third study you ran weren't exactly the same as the people that were in the first study you ran, and they're not directly comparable, uh, the results of the study. That's why you run your, all your conditions at the same time, you randomly assign people to those conditions, and you call it an experiment because it is. Everybody calls the Milgram experiment an experiment. We're going to call it an experiment, not technically an experiment. Okay. So what's the background on this concept of obedience to authority? Well, obedience to authority is an ancient concern in the history of literature and religion, theology, philosophy in, in, uh, uh, in the West. And one of the earliest recountings of obedience to authority comes from the Bible, comes from the Old Testament, the Old Bible. And it is the story of Abraham and Isaac. And the story goes basically like this. Uh, God commanded Abraham to bind and kill his own son, Isaac, at the top of like this mountain. Does anybody know what mountain it was? I know somebody knows this. Come on. Nobody? I can't hear you. So it's like you, it's like you didn't even say it. Okay. So <laughs> we don't know. Some people know, but they're too quiet for us to all know. Okay. So uh, God intervened at the last minute. So God says, take your son Isaac, take him to the top of this mountain, bind him, and then kill him uh, as an act of obedience to me. And why are you going to do it? Because I told you to do it. No other reason is given. Then at the last, so Abraham follows. Abraham is uh, obedient to authority, and so he does this. He takes Isaac to the top of the hill, he binds him, and he gets ready to kill him. And at the last minute, God intervenes and spares Isaac. And what's the moral of the story? I don't know. It's a hotly debated story. Uh, theologians gr disagree enormously on what the meaning of the story is. Some people say the meaning of the story is you've got to be obedient to God. You know, uh, If you're obedient to God, in the end, he won't make you do anything that isn't righteous. You know, uh, But you've got to trust him. He works in mysterious ways. You know, He says, kill your son. You've got to kill your son. If that's the wrong thing to do, I know, I know, I know. If that's the wrong thing to do, he'll intervene at the end and he won't make you do it. Um, God's sometimes testing you for your levels of obedience. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the meaning is. A whole other analysis of the Isaac and Abraham story is, uh, points out that, well, usually in the West we think of Isaac in this story as being a child, being very young, that Abraham's taking his very young child, binding him, and then getting ready to kill him. But actually, proper translation um, shows that Isaac was, was actually a full-grown adult, was middle-aged. And so really it's a story about both Abraham and Isaac's obedience, because Isaac was big enough to where he could have uh, easily gotten free 
and, uh, and, and couldn't really be killed by his father. So this, this portrayal is about right, where, uh, where Abraham is older and Isaac is young and could have gotten free, and they're both essentially obeying authority. Um, so one other, I mean, the main takeaway from the story, though, is that Abraham earns his esteem in God's eyes through his faith, worship, and most of all, his obedience. And I, I think that the Old Testament tale is supposed to be saying something like, you should obey God even if you don't get it. Uh, in the end, it's the right thing to do. Okay, so this is a controversial story, and you probably all have your own private opinions about the Abraham-Isaac fable, or maybe it, it happened exactly that way. I don't know. I don't know. I shouldn't have said fable. Okay, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> obedience has some obvious virtue, no doubt. It allows for social order and avoidance of the state of nature. It allows us to structure organizations. It allows me to tell you to do assignments that I think are in your best interests, and then you go do them. Whereas if your friend did that, you'd be like, you know, why, why, why would I do that assignment? There's no reason I'm going to do that. So obedience to authority is a key ingredient for hierarchies and organizations that are often very, very helpful for society to function. Uh, they're part of how we can run universities. They're part of how we can run businesses. They're part of why we can run, how we run governments, armies, all these organizations may or may not always function to do good, but uh, they all at least sometimes are useful socially. And it allows us, therefore, to maintain social organization and social order and avoid the state of nature, which I'm always telling you is uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And who said that? Thank you. All right. Thomas Hobbes. And did he have an awesome hat or bad hair? No, that's Francis Bacon. He didn't have either. Oh, my God. It's like a trick. I just tricked you. Okay, I, my apologies. He had neither. He had the funny nose. Okay. He was, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so obedience to authority, it helps with the division of labor, maintenance of large organizations, and bureaucracy. Sorry about the trick question. For some people in antiquity, obedience was really the most basic social require, requirement. It was sort of the, the first ingredient to make society go. If we didn't have obedience to authority, obedience to our parents' directives, obedience to our elders, we couldn't make society work. And this before there was uh, high levels of bureaucratization, division of labor, social organization. Everything ran on obedience to parents and elders. So for example, Plato said, both in war and in the law, you must do whatever your city and your country commands or else persuade it. In accordance with universal justice, violence is a sin against your country. And then, of course, the Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. And we'll return in a second to trends in the valuation of obedience to authority across time and culture. Because it's, uh, it's dissipated a bit in the West, which is part of why I have to tell you guys to do things multiple times. <laughs> OK. Um, obedience remains central to Eastern cultural values. Uh, People from uh, Asia tend to be higher in the valuation of obedience, and, and this may be a good thing. It's a, certainly a subjective, arbitrary cultural difference. There's no way to say who's right and who's wrong, but it is the case that research shows that obedience to authority is a more central value in the East than in the West. An example is filial piety is a core Eastern value, um, filial piety being like uh, obedience to your parents, which is a very you know, nice thing to have. We don't, we don't have that in America anymore. We got rid of that 20 years ago. There you go. <laughs> Uh, Dad, no, I totally disagree with that. Uh, I think that cross-cultural research done both by Asian and by Western uh, social scientists converges on the finding that authority, uh, obedience to authority and filial piety are more central values in the East. And I can definitely cite you references from both. It's not just a vantage point thing. Um, uh, well, it, it's not necessarily right, but uh, uh, converging evidence from multiple cultures uh, confirms this finding. That's why I'm teaching it to you. OK. So, uh, but perhaps on the decline in the East as well as the West, as documented by researchers in Asia. OK. So the main obedience to authority experiment is the Milgram experiment. And here's the basic design. And you know, you've all seen the film of the Milgram experiment. Here's some more details on it. OK, it was conducted at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut from 1960 to 1963. Uh, participants were all adult males aged between 20 and 50. 
age and occupational background was controlled across conditions. So uh, Milgram made an effort to get like a certain number of you know, manual laborers into each condition in the study and a certain number of white collar workers into each condition in the study and so on. So what Milgram's trying to do is create a pretty homogenous group of people, all white males in a certain age range. It's a pretty big age range, but it's, you know, but it's not the full you know, possible age range. And then also make sure that they're representative of different class backgrounds, and then he's controlling that across the conditions. He isn't using random assignment of conditions, which would be a pure experimental approach, but he is making some effort to make a homogenous group of people that aren't that different, and then make it the same group of people across the different versions of the study that he'll then run uh, in serial. Participants were told that they were in a learning experiment with two roles, a learner and a teacher, whose roles were randomly drawn from a hat. Do you all remember this part of the film? In order to figure out who's going to be a learner and a teacher, they, uh, the subject walks in and they're, and they're with an actor, right? And uh, the subject in the experiment, or the experimenter in the experiment comes up and is like, okay, we're going to randomly assign learner versus teacher roles. Now, what do they want? They actually want the subject in the study to always be the teacher, right? Because the teacher is the one that shocks the learner. So how do they do that? Well, they put uh, two names in a hat that supposedly say learner and teacher, and then they hand them out to the, uh, to the, the actor, the confederate, and they say, okay, pick one. The Confederate picks one. And then they give one to the subject, and they pick one. And then in actuality, they both say teacher. But the actor says, oh, mine says learner. And then the subject always pulls out teacher. And so that way, they force a sign, you're the teacher always, and the actor's always the learner, without you realizing, if you're the subject, that, that that's been forced, that that's been a structured situation. Does this make sense? It's a very clever little trick, very clever. Okay. <clears throat> so then they strap the learner, remember, who's an actor, a confederate, into an electric chair. Very alarming. The subject's watching uh, at this point in the, in the film. It's kind of amusing because the subject's like, oh, yeah, sure, you're strapping him into an electric chair. You know, of course. Uh, I assume that would happen when I came today. Yeah. And you know inside their head they're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know? uh, and also like, oh, my God, I'm glad I didn't pull the uh, learner uh, slip. Um, and then the teacher is told to read and test the learner on a series of word pairs. And the learner is supposed to remember which word is paired with some other word uh, in this series of word pairs. So uh, the teacher reads a big list and says, you know, blue bunny, you know, like yellow, you know, sickle or something. I don't know why I said that. And then, uh, uh, and then they come back through later and they're like blue. And then the learner is supposed to say bunny, you know. So, okay, I know, ridiculous. Okay, so the learner gets several answers wrong, and the teacher is told by the experimenter to administer shocks every time the learner gets a question wrong. And as the level of shock increases, so do grunts and shouts of pain. So the, uh, there's actually a, a video or an audio tape that's being played from the other room. The actor isn't really grunting and shouting in pain. Instead, they did it one time, it was recorded, and then these shouts of pain are programmed to play after the teacher, the subject in the study, presses the shock buttons. And so they get worse and worse and worse as the level of shock increases. Then at 180 volts, the learner says he can't stand the pain anymore and he, he wants to uh, leave the experiment. Uh, but the experimenter tells the teacher to keep going, tells the, sub, uh, the, uh, the subject in the study to keep going. Then at 300 volts, the learner says he refuses to answer. I'm not participating in this experiment anymore because you're just shocking me and, and it's pissing me off. Um, and the experimenter orders the teacher to continue nonetheless. And the experimenter says a series of extremely creepy things to the, uh, to the learner, uh, including the experiment requires you to continue. And you have no choice. You must continue. And uh, you remember the guy in the otter shirt in the replication really didn't like that, right? He was, like, he was like, man, I do have a choice. I do not need to continue. You told me I could leave at any time. So, uh, so the big question is, how many participants in the study went to the 30th level, the one that was labeled danger, severe shock, triple X? Now, if you look at that, right, if you look at this, at this like, electrification machine, right, the shock machine, and it's got these, a whole bunch of switches that increase in voltage and go up, and then the last one says 450 volts, uh, danger, severe shock, triple X. Like, what would you assume would happen when you press that button? I would think I would assume that, I'd be, that the person would die, right? Wouldn't you assume that? I don't know. That's what I would assume. Or that at least that there was great risk they could die. So how many people went to that level? How many people were willing to press that button that they had good reason to think might kill the person in the other room, a guy that they just met and that they know from the hat drawing experience could be them, 
It could be that. It's just a coin flip that made it not them. Well, Milgram was a very fancy man, and so he tried to establish how counterintuitive his findings were. How did he do this? He went and did a survey of 110 psychiatrists, college students, and middle-class adults. I don't know why he picked these people. It seemed to be the first 110 people he ran into, basically. All of them said that they would personally disobey around 135 volts, right? They said, I, I, would I wouldn't go that high on that thing. Granted, you tricked me for a little while, but, you know, by 135, no way. And some of them said, I wouldn't do this at all. This is absurd. And then no one said they'd go beyond uh, 300 volts. Oh, okay. Wait, what? Don't those seem like... Okay, well, anyway. Okay. So, yeah. All said they'd stop by 135. No one said they'd go past 300. Okay. And the psychiatrist estimated that only about one in a thousand people, total psychopaths, total sociopaths, would ever go to the triple X level. That's what the psychiatrist said. And they're paid to know about sociopathy and psychopathy, right? So they should know. And so they're saying less than 1%, you know, one-tenth of 1% are going to go all the way. Uh, you know, Professor Milgram, you're wasting your time. Milgram delighted in this and ran the experiment anyway. So in condition one, uh, there's actually no voice. Okay, so I told you about the version of the experiment in the film where there's all, these, uh, all this screaming. And what's the rate of compliance in that condition? Do you remember? It's what, 70, you said? Yeah, about two-thirds. Okay, and I think we're going to get to, I'll give you the exact number in a second. I just didn't write it first. Uh, so about two-thirds of people, despite the fact that supposedly one in a thousand people are going to do this, according to psychiatrists who are paid to know, two-thirds of people actually went all the way. And here's some results from some of the other specific conditions. In condition one, the very first condition of the study that he ran, uh, there was no voice. There was only pounding on the wall, and then the learner stops answering. So not even as bad as the whole one you watch in the film with the heart condition and the I refuse to participate and you're hurting me and the screams. Just pounding on the wall uh, and then uh, stopped answering. 65% of people went the whole way in that one. Condition two was the one I described. It was the second one that he ran. And there were these verbal complaints. Then eventually he refuses to answer at 300. So yeah, it was about two thirds at 63%. Condition three. The learner is uh, 1.5 feet away from the teacher. Uh, so in this one, the subject is, uh, is, is like as close to, to, you know, to the person that they're electrocuting as I am to Nora now. And, and in a sense, you know, I, I, I am threatening to electrocute Nora. So, um, so 1.5 feet away, what does that do to the rates of obedience? It, it, it goes down from 65% or 63%. It goes down from two-thirds to 40%. So 40% of people are still willing to continue pressing the switches until they get to the 450 triple X level. In condition four, notice Milgram's trying to crank it up, right? He's trying to crank it up to where there, there's no way that, the, uh, that they would actually do it. There's no way that they would do it. There's no way that the teacher would actually continue to, I see your hand, I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, there's no way that they would actually go all the way. And so he makes an experimental condition where there's just no chance. Where the experimenter, or sorry, where the, uh, the teacher, the subject in the study, has to literally press the learner's hand down on what's, what's identified as a shock plate. And then the learner screams and uh, shakes his body. Remember, he's an actor and, and uh, just generally acts you know, like he's being electrocuted. Uh, and it, just the obvious pain this person is feeling is just right there. It's not even 1.5 feet away. Your hand is on his hand, pressing his hand down on an electroshock plate, which I guess it's been explained to you that that won't electrocute you, I guess, or something. Um, and then, so surely no one will shock anybody in this condition, and definitely no one's going to go the whole way, right? But in fact, still, they followed orders. They still shocked people, and 30% went the whole way to the 450-volt level. Yes? I don't think so. I think they're just right next to each other. So it's that same acting, flailing, I'm being electrocuted. Uh, in the conditions where the subject, where the, where the learner is in another room, then the voice is recorded. Well, in condition one, there's no voice, um, except their answers to the questions, you know, where they just go, blue, bunny, whatever. But they don't, they don't like scream and shout or anything like that. Oh, no, actually, in that one, there's literally no voice, actually, and the answers are relayed through like a light system. So, so in, I'm giving you a, what, no, no one was ever really shocked. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, to be clear, no one's ever really shocked in this experiment, um, which, you know, means it's ethical, right? You know, yeah. So, uh, so, okay, but just to be clear, in condition one, it, answers are relayed through a light system, and there's no voice, and there's just pounding on the wall. That's the only reason you know that somebody's being bothered by this. Uh, condition two is the one that I described in detail, very, very similar to the one in the uh, film, though it's actually not exactly the one in the film, but we won't get into that. The one in the film adds a heart problem on top of that. But this one, it's the one I described in great detail. The su it's the second one he ran. Subjects complain, and they're like, you know, please stop friggin' shocking me. They yell and scream, and then they stop answering at 300 volts, about the same level. Condition three, in the same room now, so you can hear them, uh, you can see them flailing, and it drops to 40%. Condition four, you have to press their hand down on a shock plate. You see them flailing, and you have to literally touch them and make them, make them do it, make them be electrocuted. There was a question in the back. Yes? I was just curious, like, the experiments Yes, yes, yes. It's coming. You're quite right. OK, experiment is set a few feet away, uh, <laughs> just as you predicted. Um, 65%. That's, again, I think that actually is condition two. Okay. That is condition two, where the, where the, no, 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 it can't be. Okay, it must be condition one. Where the experimenter sits a few feet away. But then, in another condition, the experimenter leaves and then gives instructions back via a telephone. Um, so the experimenter's like, I gotta go. Uh, shock the hell out of that guy, and I'll talk to you on the phone, you know? And, uh, or I'll text message you or something like that, you know, like, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll I am about it. And so the experimenter leaves, gives the instructions via the telephone, and what are they manipulating here? The distance of authority, right? Like the authority is very far away. There isn't that feeling of immediacy to the commands. Uh, there's maybe a little bit of a feeling you could disobey and get away with it. And, uh, and indeed, that's what happened. The subjects were like, uh, you know, many of them lied and said that they were following instructions. They'd be like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm shocking, I'm shocking the hell out of them, just like you told me to. Um, and only 23% of people went all the way. But I would, I mean, I would say that's kind of amazing, right? You walk into an experiment, uh, you, you, you don't know anybody here from Adam, you might be the guy that's being shocked to death. He's being shocked to death for no good reason, you know, no reason, no good reason at all. This crazy psychology experiment about learning and like, and, and electroshock reinforcement, a totally useless, pointless experiment. And, then the experimenter weirdly leaves halfway through, calls you on the phone, and tells you to shock this man to death. And a quarter of the people still do it, right? Uh, so if you want to understand like, how it is that human beings could do awful, awful acts of obedience to authority, I mean, this is a great insight, right? This is this crazy circumstance. There's no reason to do this. You got one person telling you not to do it, this guy's screaming in the other room, this other person telling you to do it, and you weirdly go ahead and do it at a very high rate, very disturbing. In another one, the experimenter never appears uh, and just gives instructions via a tape recording. And actually, Milgram didn't report the rate of obedience in this, uh, but it's less than when the experimenter's present. I'm sorry, but that's all he said. Uh, one of the problems with ex identifying these conditions as cleanly as you'd like them to be or as I would like them to be uh, is that Milgram was a very eccentric guy. He was a sort of mad genius, social psychologist, mad scientist type character. And he didn't even write up these studies for like a long time, like 10 years or something. And then there was, you know, everybody knew about them. They'd seen them presented. He'd published this one very small piece on them. But then he had never, like, really presented the whole thing or in a, in a book or an article. Can someone wake that woman up who's asleep behind you? Do you mind? Thank you. OK. You're missing college. College is awesome. So OK. So. He had never published it, and then people were like, you, uh, you need to publish this, or else somebody's going to go run it themselves and get all the credit for this great idea you had. And so he's like, uh, oh, OK, now, now I'll write it. And so literally 14 years after he first started the experiments, he, he published a book documenting all these conditions. And even then, it was sort of like kind of loosey-goosey, his write-up. OK, so some other conditions. Condition, run was rerun, uh, uh, condition one was rerun with females. Uh, trying to see, is there a gender difference? Is there some difference between men and women in their likelihood to obey? Some people thought, oh, you know, women, they wouldn't do this. Women are good people, uh, you know, as opposed to men. Obviously, you know, that's true. But nonetheless, uh, women conformed, or sorry, obeyed authority at the same rate as men did in the first study, almost exactly. Or, no, actually, exactly. 
Also, the heart problem condition, this one is like the one I described, except the guy says he has a heart condition, and this is the one in the film that you watched however many years ago, 50% rates of obedience to authority. Uh, another one is the participant doesn't have to actually do the shocking, they just have to give orders to another shocker. Uh, so, the, so in this case, there's two actors, two confederates, as we call them, and one of them is the, you know, the learner who's being taught with shocks. Uh, another one is the, uh, the, like, another shocker. And the subject's job is just to relay these orders to that shocker. And in that condition, participants were willing to give orders up to the 450 triple X level at a 93% rate. This is a very interesting condition I want to return to later in this lecture. And this is, what if you didn't have to do it yourself, you just had to tell somebody to do it? And we know when you tell somebody to do it, they're going to do it at a 65% rate or so. But what if all you had to do was just tell them? Would you do it? Would you follow orders? Would you pass orders on uh, to kill somebody? And 93% of the time, the answer was yes. And then another one, participant is run with two disobedient confederates. And uh, that's, that's kind of an amazing. It's sort of the Ash experiment versus the Milgram experiment, right? Like in the Ash experiment, you know, seven people do or eight people do something, and they try and see if you'll do it. In this one, uh, they got the you know obedience to authority. You got the experimenter telling you what to do, but then you also have two other participants who are like, "I'm not going to do this. This is this is bad shit, crazy." And what did people do? Participants uh, complied only 10% of the time. So this is an interesting insight that if you could somehow marshal conformity pressures against obedience pressures, maybe you could, uh, you could upend them. And in a way, that's sort of like what happens in, in a revolution or in collective action, is uh, people come together as a group against authority. Also, they, they were interested in, wait, maybe this is all just like we're running this at Yale, at New Haven, you know, and people are intimidated and freaked out by this fancy pants Ivy League institution. We wouldn't be because we know that, you know, public schools are better. But... <laughs> Uh, you know, they're like, maybe some people dilute, you know, for some strange reason think Yale is really awesome. So we'll run it somewhere else. They ran it in downtown Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is just, uh, you know, just a normal industrial town in New England. It wasn't even New Haven. And they were like, okay, now we're not in New Haven. Uh, we're not identifying ourselves as Yale researchers. We're not on the campus. We take away all that authority. And, uh, and what happens? Well, there's no difference. It's the same rate of obedience. Some more notes about the experiment. Milgram actually, in the first version of the experiment, had no feedback from the learner. He just, all it was was just participants could see the outline of the learner against like a door. So like it was like a door with like a window cut in it, and you could see just the shadow of the person that you're shocking to death. And uh, what they found, what he found was there was too much obedience, too much for it to be a useful condition, because he wanted to study what kind of conditions would increase obedience and decrease it. So in his first one, everyone went to the 450 triple X level, so he discontinued the study after like 15 subjects and ran a more challenging study that would be more impressive, because the first condition he ran, everyone obeyed. Everybody was willing to kill the guy because he was just a shadow on the, in a window. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, and one thing that was interesting in this condition is participants showed a reluctance to look at the learner. They would, the, the teachers would, you know, try to avert their eyes and not even look at the shadow. Um, and this idea being that uh, people dehumanize their victims. But also that if you can dehumanize your victim, then you'll be able to, you'll be more likely to be able to uh, end their life. Also, uh, this is a weird calculation Milgram did. I told you about these first four conditions, right? I went condition one, two, three, four. There's 160 people total in those conditions. Of them, 71 of those participants showed nervous laughter or smiling during the study, which is something they talk about in the film, right? It's like this very alarming, weird thing that happens that these people would laugh and titter and, uh, and smile, and it makes them seem like total assholes, basically, right? You're like, oh my god, they're like mendacious, evil people. They're not just shocking these people to death for no good reason. They're doing it while they laugh and smile. And uh, Milgram didn't interpret it that way, though. He didn't say, these are terrible people. Uh, he said, instead, it's nervous laughter. It's nervous smiling. And when they would interview the people afterwards, they would often say, no, I was like absurdly nervous. Like, I've, I've, I've never been as nervous as I was in that situation, because I felt like I had to follow the orders, and I didn't want to. Um, so that, that nervousness, that anxiety leaked out in the form of uh, laughter and smiling. Yes? 
Uh, no, I don't think that any of the learners were women. Uh, I think they always had a man, and I think they may have always had that one guy, too. Uh, I don't know. I've never heard anything about that. That's an interesting question. Yes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I don't know, that's a good question. Okay, so the question is, in the experiment in the film, the heart condition one, which is very, very similar to the one that I described in detail, where just the guy, you know, complains and, and screams and howls, uh, they give the subject in the study a, uh, a quick shock, you know? They say, okay, just so you know that these are real and what they feel like, here's one, and it's like, oh, that, that hurt, you know? And it's like 15 volts. And so you're supposed to imagine, you know, 30 times that. Um, so yeah, in that condition, uh, okay, so in that condition, that might have helped people understand that their that their shocking could really hurt the person because they just experienced that it shocked themselves. And uh, I don't know whether they did that in all the conditions. I'm guessing they did, but I don't know. There's a question over here. It's actually it's funny. There was an experiment that was done talking about these minimal, tiny shocks. There was an experiment that was done at uh, Cornell while I was there. Uh, in the lab right next to mine, and I remember when I was a graduate student there, and I remember hearing all of a sudden this screaming next door, and in the experiment they used these tiny, tiny shocks that were like not, not the kind of thing that could hurt you at all. Uh, human subjects was like, sure, fine, you can use these tiny shocks, we don't care. And uh, I don't know what they were studying, but anyway, they used these tiny shocks in this experiment, and what had happened was the machine malfunctioned, this would never happen in the study that you'll participate in in this class. Could, couldn't happen. Uh, the machine malfunctioned, and the subject in the study was repeatedly getting the little shock, you know? And they freaked out. They were like, they just started screaming. And then, uh, worse yet, the undergraduate research assistant who was running them came in and started screaming as well. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so they're both like screaming, panicking, uh, and, uh, and, and the research assistant starts tearing off all the nodes and stuff from the person, screaming at the, the top of his or her lungs. And uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it was pretty funny. That woman uh, that was in that study, they got repeatedly very minor shocks, no damage at all, uh, but very alarming uh, when this machine malfunction <laughs> malfunctions and is repeatedly minimally shocking you. Uh, she got many, many conciliatory letters from psychology professors over the next couple weeks. Uh, they're basically like, please, God, don't sue us for this. Uh, OK, all right, not funny, not funny, of course not. OK, so as we think about the Milgram experiment, as we interpret it, remember the percentages only reflect those who went all the way. Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so those are the percentages of the people that go all the way. So those are the people that go to 450 volts. This isn't even the rate of people that go to like 250 or 300 volts, right? Which is pretty damn high. You know, that's pretty alarming. This is after the person's been screaming and complaining. People are still going. So the rates of that are actually much higher. Uh, when I tell you 65% of people, you know, went all the way, I'm talking about they they went all the way to the level where they really should know that they're killing the person. But at least in the hard condition uh, version, the one that's in the film, even the 50% that don't go all the way, a good portion of them have good reason to think they might have induced a heart attack in this guy. So really, you know, the rates of like people willing to go to a point where they should know that they may be uh, killing the person or at least, uh, you know, greatly harming them is way, way higher, like up around 80% across conditions. Thomas Blass is a Milgram scholar, and he did uh, a meta-analysis. Does anybody know what a meta-analysis is? It's where you take a bunch of data sets and put them together and then try to analyze trends or overall findings in them. Psychologists are fond of doing this because they run lots of little studies, but then, you know, 20 years will go by, go by and they'll have like just tons of cognitive dissonance studies and they'll say, ha ha, this is ripe for a meta-analysis. We'll put them all together and we'll see how strong the average effect is and, and get this insight. So um, Blass was interested in a few questions. He was interested in men versus women, you know, whether there's a, a gender difference in rates of obedience. And he was also interested in whether rates of obedience declined over time. So he's like, this is perfect for a meta-analysis. I'll get all the data on studies that have been done in the Milgram setting, not just the ones that Milgram did in the early 60s, but all the replications people did after that. I'll put them all together into one big data set and analyze it. And this is what he found. 
he found that men and women overall were equally obedient. And he found actually the 65% number that people are always telling you, the two-thirds, uh, is about right. That overall obedience in Milgram-type settings in experiments across like a 25-year period before human subjects committees basically banned them from ever being run again, uh, thankfully, uh, was about 65%. And then, uh, and then men and women are about equal. However, they did find, he did find in the meta-analysis that women report more stress, uh, which is interesting, I think. And that could be because men face greater social stigmas, in this culture anyway, for expressing uh, anxiety and neuroticism, uh, or that's, that's what some research has showed. Or it could be that the women were actually more stressed out. Uh, it's hard to know how to interpret that, but it is, it is interesting in a kind of you know, uh, grim sort of way. Um, all of this is sort of morbid fascination type research. Okay, also reviewed Milgram-style obedience studies from 1961 to 1985 and tried to see, is there a correlation between year and rates of obedience? And what would be your hunch on this, right? Mine, mine would be that obedience has gone down in our culture over the last, you know, 50 years or so. And I think most people, you know, would say that. And I think, actually, there's good evidence for that, and I'll show you some of that evidence later. Uh, certainly, if we went back to 100 years ago, we'd find that people were definitely more obedient in day-to-day -day life, I think, than they are now. So he was interested in maybe there's a negative correlation between year and rates of obedience. As year goes up, the rate of obedience will go down. Okay? But he didn't find that. Instead, he found a zero correlation, no co significant correlation between year and obedience rates. So for some reason, in the studies that were done in the Milgram experiment, uh, people did not decrease in their rates of obedience across time. And so I think I told you, after the Ash conformity study, which is the other most famous social psychology study we've, we've covered in this class, uh, that people were always interested in, was this just a child of its time? Did people just conform a lot in the 50s or before the 50s, and now you wouldn't be able to replicate the ASH experiment? And we found kind of mixed evidence on that. Uh, here, this is pretty strong evidence that the Milgram experiment is not a child of its time uh, and actually persisted into the mid-80s as a phenomenon that would happen. Some other st stuff about the Milgram experiment. Milgram originally planned a comparative study of Germany, the United States, and Australia. And he was interested in national character, this thing that people used to study, uh, cultural differences between nations and countries and whatever, or, or, or sub, you know, uh, subcultural differences in countries. But in this case, he was interested in uh, specifically why it was that Germany, why the Third Reich had risen in Germany. And was it the case that there was something about German character the culture in Germany that made people uniquely obedient. And a lot of people say this all the time. They say, oh, the reason that the Nazis rose to power in Germany in the 30s was because Germans are so obedient. And, and he was interested in using the United States as a, as a comparison case, but he felt like he needed another comparison case, too, because maybe the U.S. is weird, so he used Australia, because nobody really had any sort of hunches about how obedient anybody was in Australia. Yes? Right. Might, might this be a problematic research design because in Germany they're like less obedient as a result of the whole World War II Third Reich thing? Yes, I think that's a totally valid possibility. Also, they might be like, I see what you're up to. You're trying to see if I'll electrocute somebody who's perfectly innocent and you're an American experimenter. I totally get what you're up to. Uh, that could have been a problem too. Yeah. So the question is, is the meta-analysis of the rates of obedience across time tainted by the fact that people learn about the Milgram experiment a lot in, uh, in college? So I have, I have many answers to that. My main thought is, no, not that bad of a concern. Because one, uh, by 1985, this was not actually that well known. Uh, in 1985, it was nothing like now. I would say the actual like, popular awareness of the Milgram experiment really took off about 10 years ago. Um, yes? I have The lack of a bias about? Wait, what do you mean? Why would that account for the correlation? If it, or the lack of a correlation? Oh, I see. 
Right, right. But if you went 1985 to 2009, then you'd find a drop off in rates of obedience because people are now aware of it. Yeah, I guess that's possible. But I don't think that would mean there's an actual drop off of rates of obedience in society or in you know, situations where you're getting directives from authority. It would just mean in the Milgram experiment, people are wise to the experiment. So, and we're hoping that this is indicative of larger social trends. We're not interested in conformity, or sorry, obedience to authority in just the Milgram setting. We're interested in it in settings in general. So the fact that people are wise to it in the Milgram experiment isn't so much the concern. The concern is, you know, overall, as our culture changed and how obedient to authority they would be in different settings. You have a question or a point? Right, yes, thank you, yeah. Right, that's an excellent answer, yes. We just watched a replication of the Belgium experiment from two years ago from a region very close to here, and they found essentially the same rates of obedience, yeah. Now, maybe those people weren't all college educators or something, but the point is, they're from 2009. Whether they were exposed to it or not, they kept doing it at about the same rate. So there's good reason, lots of reason to think that this phenomenon isn't, hasn't gone away. Thank you for pointing that out. I showed you this film, but I totally forgot that I showed you the film. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Milgram was going to go to Germany, the United States, and Australia and compare rates of obedience in these three different settings and try and figure out, is there something inherent in German national character, something we don't say anymore? We now say culture because um, we think it sounds less nasty. Um, so uh, is there something inherent in German national culture, culture, whatever, uh, that uh, provided for the Third Reich? But instead, Milgram found so much obedience in the United States that it seemed unnecessary. Remember that in the very first version of the experiment that he ran with just the shadow in the window, he found nearly 100% 100% rates of obedience. When he cranked it up a little bit in terms of like people shouting and screaming, stop electrocuting me, uh, he still found like 65% rates of obedience. So it simply didn't make sense to go to Germany and try and find higher rates of obedience. It probably wasn't in the cards. It would be pretty hard to find much higher rates of obedience to authority. And this, in a way, is a great example of a, of a theme that you'll find that's common in this class of social psychologists stumbling onto great experiments or great insights through experiments. We often say that experiments are, are not a good tool for exploratory research or for discovery. Because to even design an experiment, you have to have some hunch about what's going to happen, right? You know, if you're going to set up a medical experiment, you have to have this hunch that this medicine will perform better than the placebo. You know, in the ash experiment, why would you pay eight confederates to say the wrong answer unless you had a hunch that that would influence the ninth person? Uh, so experiments are generally not thought of, a good, uh, thought of as a good discovery mechanism. They're very good for testing claims that you're not sure uh, are true or not, but they're not so good for discovering new claims, right? But every once in a while, they're really good for that, too. And there's a few uh, classic examples from the class. Jones and Harris, 1967, uh, Castro essay study. In that one, they, that was supposed to be a control condition, uh, the one where the experimenter assigns you to write the pro or the anti-Castro uh, essay. And they were interested in whether uh, people would say, oh, no, that person doesn't endorse that belief. And then in conditions where you're told the, the people voluntarily wrote the pro and anti-Castro essays, then you say, oh, OK. Uh, then they must really, you know, believe this belief. It was going to be a really boring friggin' study. I have no idea why they ran it. They were basically running like, if you're told the experimenter told you to do something, do you not assume that the person believes it? Well, of course, you know. Uh, but instead, they stumbled onto a great finding that helped make Ned Jones help help make Ned Jones's career, which was that people would make the same assumptions even if, it, if the essay assignment was was assigned to you. And in the Milgram studies, he was trying to say something about German national character being crazy and whack and really, really obedient to authority. And instead, he found the, that that was the case essentially everywhere. And uh, in some studies that are coming up later in the class on social identity theory, the minimal group studies, they found a similar thing where they just stumbled into a great classic finding. By the way, William Shatner played Stanley Milgram in the TV movie The Tenth Level, which is a pretty, <laughs> pretty amusing portrayal. Very hard to find, or at least it used to be very hard to find. All right. Oh, yeah, and the experiment in the Milgram film, not Milgram. Stanley Milgram looks like this. He has a beard, and he looks really sheepish all the time. Uh, he's not that guy. He does. He does. You know. uh, Milgram was a very self-conscious guy. He was sort of embarrassed to be alive. And <laughs> he was. He was. He was a very eccentric guy and uh, a very, very interesting guy. That guy, Thomas Blass, who did the meta-analysis of uh, results of obedience experiments, he also wrote a biography of Milgram, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's very interesting. Have you, does anybody know the title of that biography? The Man Who Shocked the World. Very, <laughs> very clever. So anyway, the guy in the film is not Milgram. He's an actor playing an experimenter. OK, so now we're going to take a two or three minute break, and then we'll resume with the Obedience to Authority lecture. 
Okay, uh, a lot of people have been asking, how can you, before we talk about this really quick, uh, a lot of people have been asking, how can you get the assignment back, or the assignments back, uh, the 1,500 assignments we tried to hand back after class that one time, uh, that was a lot of fun for everybody, all of you and us as well. Um, and then we tried again, and that, that was also a good time. And then there's still assignments, and not all of you have gotten them, and many of you have very good reasons. And so you can get them today between 1 and 2.30 from Nora. Or no, Nora, you won't be there. They're just going to, oh, you'll be there. Okay, in 420 Barrows. So 420 Barrows Hall on the University of California, Berkeley campus. 1 to 2.30, they'll be there for you to come get them, and, and Nora will be there, and, uh, and she'll help you get them. Okay, is that clear? Cool. Okay. So, uh, the Cool Hand Luke essay assignment. I told you there would be one. I gave you some vague sense of what to look for in the film. Uh, now we're going to actually get to the concrete assignment, the Cool Hand Luke, cool Hand Luke assignment. You have one week to complete it, 168 hours. Uh, it's due next Thursday, March the 5th, not next Wednesday, February something, whatever was on the online thing. So if you downloaded the PowerPoint slides before I fix this, uh, please fix it for me. Okay. So it's due Thursday, March 5th. And what you're expected to do is write an essay uh, about the role of any of the following factors in the film Cool Hand Luke. Any, you know, one, two, three, or all four factors in the film Cool Hand Luke. And they are conformity, non-conformity, obedience, disobedience. You may be saying, how can I even talk about obedience without talking about disobedience? Great, I agree with you. That's terrific. You may be saying conformity is just the opposite of non-conformity. I'm with you there, too. So really, this is just two concepts. Uh, write about one or both of them in your essay. Now, what do we want? What do we want you to do? We want you to make some claim. Make some claim about the role of conformity and or obedience in the film Cool Hand Luke, and then support it with evidence uh, from the film. And you can use class materials, lecture slides, Cialdini book, the Milgram reading, uh, for information on conformity and obedience. That way you'll be sure that you're right about what you're saying about conformity and obedience. For example, it would be a terrible mistake to say that uh, obedience to authority is the actor-observer bias, and then write about groupthink for like three pages. That would be a big mistake. So review the relevant class materials, uh, cite them if you like, and state, make accurate claims about what conformity and obedience are, or obe you could write about just one if you want. Make some claim and support it. So, let's be very clear about the format. The format is, the length should be four to five pages. That's a highly restrictive page length you're saying. Yes, it is. That's on purpose. Uh, the papers will be graded, like A, B, C, D, that kind of grading system. And they'll count for more than the prior essays. The Cool Hand Luke. And the Grand Illusion essays count for more than the, uh, the smaller essays, like the breaching essay or the, uh, the perspective-taking essay that you did on a recent conflict or uh, the subsequent essays you'll write later in the semester. Uh, so the papers will be graded, and they'll count for a little more. They're still not going to count for as much as these exams. They're going to count for maybe roughly 40% what the exams you know, are worth, maybe around 10% of your grade, a little bit less than 10%, though. Okay, so that's how much the paper's worth and how it's graded. How do we want you to write it, this four to five page paper? We want you to write it in five paragraph essay style, though not necessarily exactly five paragraphs, but in that style of structure and organization. Uh, how many people here know what the hell I'm talking about? Five paragraph essay style. Okay, that's very good. Those of you that don't, go online and get information on what exactly this five paragraph essay style is, uh, or even if you do know what I'm talking about, maybe brush up on it. Now, what does that mean? What is the five-paragraph essay style? The five-paragraph essay style is basically that you have an intro paragraph that sort of introduces your argument. At some point in that paragraph, often in maybe the third or fourth sentence, you'll have a, a clean, bold, clear statement of your thesis. And that's the claim you're making in the essay. And then you'll often have a sentence or the end of that sentence where you say, I'll support this with the following types of evidence. And that sort of previews the paragraphs that come. You'll then have three or more paragraphs that offer supporting evidence for that thesis statement. And so, you know, the first paragraph might say, I'm going to support that statement in this way. And the second, or the second of the supporting paragraphs says, I'll support it in this way. And the third one says, also this body of evidence from the film supports my statement. And then finally, you'll conclude with the fifth paragraph, or maybe it's the sixth or seventh, fine, fine. But the final paragraph will be a concluding paragraph, where you say, okay, I gave all this evidence. It supported my statement, because I'm so right. 
and I say the statement again to be redundant, and, uh, and then you try really hard to write some kind of catchy last sentence. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> yeah. That's how it always worked for me. And then you try to make it like somehow make your five paragraph essay speak to like the meaning of life in one sentence, you know? <clears throat> Um, okay. All right. Are there questions about that? Oh, okay. Some other things. Don't do bogus margins or spacing. This is a very clever trick that many of you have learned. Uh, we know it, we're on to you. When you grade a stack of 80 of these, you can just look at the margins and be like, oh, these are the people tricking me. Um, you know, if you change the fonts, we're, we're, we're wise to that too. Our readers are extraordinarily experienced. They were all former undergraduates. They've all pulled these tricks before. So. Um, they're on to you. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do I want 12 point font, double spaced, all that stuff? Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Thank you for clarifying. Times New Roman. That's our preference. Arial, no, yeah, it's kind of ugly. You know, we don't, <laughs> we don't like it as much. We really don't. Okay, Tahoma, I mean, what is that, right? Tahoma. Uh, Okay, evaluation criteria. Uh, we would like to have proper structure, proper structure. Please follow this structure. Let this be an exercise in obedience to authority. Uh, second, we would like to see a central claim or, or maybe coupled claims, you know, maybe a complex argument with a couple claims in it, that's fine. But a uh, central claim with good supporting evidence from the film. Uh, so this is being graded in a very, I don't know, you might say high schoolish kind of way. But one thing that happens, I think, when you get to college uh, that I'm critical of is that you'll get some of your writing teachers go, hey, that five paragraph essay style that they hopefully taught you in high school, keep doing that. We love that. That's very well organized. It's very tight. It's a good way to make a statement, support it with, our, with, with evidence, and then close with the statement. It's logical. It's good. You know, so some people like me are like, great, keep doing that. You know? And then other people are like, you need to loosen up your essay structure. You need to throw off the shackles of the five paragraph essay and embrace your inner muse. Don't do that. Don't do that here. There may be places in life where that's totally appropriate and a good idea. Not on this assignment, though. Um, creative writing, for example. Don't do your creative writing in five paragraph essay style, especially if you're writing like poetry or a play. Um, <laughs> other kinds of writing, you're writing journalistic writing, not appropriate, et cetera. Technical writing might not be appropriate, usually probably is. But anyway, uh, as far as basic writing skills, one thing you should get from college is nail this way to write an essay. Even if it's not the only way to write an essay, it's a great, useful tool for you to come from college with. So uh, let this hopefully contribute to you developing that skill set. Or really, you're already getting there. Let's master it. OK. Uh, the Cool Hand Luke essay assignment in very small print. Here are some sample theses. OK, so you're probably wondering at this point, what, kind, what would I do? OK, I'm supposed to write about themes of conformity and obedience or, and or uh, obedience in Cool Hand Luke. What would be an example of an argument that I might then go to develop, you know, get supportive evidence uh, from the film to support? What would be an example of some of these arguments? Well, you could keep it simple, and simple is fine. Um, this is an exercise in a well-executed, tight essay. So you could keep it simple and say, Cool and Luke is a film that's centrally about disobeying authority. And you could just make the case, not even bring up conformity. Just talk about disobeying authority. Here's evidence from the film, three types of evidence or periods in the film, you know, that, that support this claim, and then you close out, you say, ha ha, I proved it, I'm good, give me my A, all right. Another simple one, you could say, while the lead character in the film, Cool Hand Luke, frequently disobeys authority, he is just as motivated by a desire to be a uh, disconformist, what, to be a a nonconformist, sorry, a nonconformist among his fellow prisoners. That would be, you know, a slightly more nuanced kind of thing. You say, okay, it looks like a film that's about disobedience to authority, he's cutting off you know, the heads of uh, parking meters, you got the warden of the jail saying, you know, you got a problem with authority. And, but really, I think this film is secretly a lot about nonconformity. And nonconformity is different from disobedience. Disobedience is when you disobey orders from an authority. Nonconformity is when you don't act like your peers, you know? And it's really a film that's as much about nonconformity as it is about disobedience. So that would be interesting, pretty simple. You could support that. Uh, I would enjoy reading that essay. That would be a, something I would do for fun on a Friday. Let's just read that essay. I'd read it multiple times. Okay. So uh, more complex. Uh, 
Here's an example of more complex thesis. Please, please be quiet. Uh, though the lead character in Cool and Luke strives to be a nonconformist and disobedient, he never ultimately achieves his goals. In many subtle ways, he is still very much a conformist and obedient to authority. Hmm, that's clever. That's subtle. That'd be nice if you can support it, right? Maybe it's not that clever. But anyway, the best essay that I've ever read on this essay assignment basically had that thesis. And it was, it was totally clever. It was about how even though Luke is trying to construct his own rules for how he's going to live his life and disobey authority and be a nonconformist, ultimately in subtle ways throughout the film, uh, you know, he's, he's actually still totally conformist and obedient. It's uh, Hodgins, actually. Yeah, it's very good, too. Um, it, was, it had this beautiful last sentence, like she really pulled off the last sentence thing, and it was great. Okay. Uh, can you stop text messaging in my class? Thank you. Yes, or whatever you're doing on the thing. Okay, Cool and Luke demonstrates how nonconformity and disobedience, though socially unacceptable, are essential to individual happiness and fulfillment. That would be interesting if you were going to say, oh, you know, Luke has to do this stuff in order to be happy, and if he doesn't, he's not happy, and look at how unhappy the people are who just obey and are conformists. That would be interesting. I would enjoy that. I'd read that on a Saturday. <laughs> this... This one, uh, the film Cool Hand Luke exposes an interesting contradiction of social life, how there are social benefits to conformity and obedience, these are quite obvious, but also social benefits to nonconformity and disobedience. Or you might even just talk about conformity in a statement like this, whatever. Okay, so are you getting a sense of like some claims or thesis, thesis statements that you could construct and then hang your essay on? I'd love for you to come up with something besides these, by the way, though I don't strictly require it. Uh, it would be very cool if you came up with your own thesis statement. Um, questions? OK. OK. Really? 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 OK. I like that there's no questions, but I'm very suspicious. OK. So you got the structure. You got some example theses that you could potentially use, and we've learned a ton about Cool and Luke. We've learned a ton about uh, conformity and obedience. So, um, so that should be clear. Any no questions? No questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, yes. If you make references, if you make in-text citations, please give bibliography at the end. That'd be great. Excellent question. That's a great question. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I don't know yet. We, uh, we the readers are still grading the breaching exercises, so uh, there's a little bit of a lag. I'll try to let you know as soon as I know, though. Feel free to ask uh, next class meeting. I'll probably know more if I forget to say anything. Okay. All right, so. Oh, shit. I just went through. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just whizzing through the material. Are you following all this? This is good, right? We're just going really fast now. Okay. Okay. So what are some conclusions from the Milgram experiment? What are some things that we find matters? I mean, one of the big observations from the Milgram experiment is people obey a lot, right? They obey authority way more than you would think they would. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yes, that's interesting. Most people leave uh, learning about the Milgram experiment with that being the only insight. That and social psychologists are very freaky individuals in white coats. Another, another observation is uh, the proximity of the victim matters. So uh, why did the, uh, what evidence do we have for that? Well, Milgram ran all these different versions of study where he made the victim more proximal, right? He had the one where they're behind you know, a, a window and you barely even see them, and people you know, obey authority every time, right? They have the one where they're in the other room and you don't hear much of them, and then they obey authority at a very high rate. Then you hear them with the heart condition, you obey, them, uh, you obey authority a little bit less, and then eventually they're 1.5 feet away, and the rate of uh, obedience to authority goes down to like 40%, and eventually you're pressing their hand down on a shock plate, killing them right in front of your own eyes, and you only do it 30% of the time. Aren't, aren't we virtuous people? So uh, why would the proximity of the victim matter so much? Well, there's a few reasons. One is credibility of the study. You're much more likely to believe that the, can you all stop talking? The person who was just text messaging. Thank you. So you're much more likely to find the study credible if you can see the person and you're pretty damn sure that they're there, that they're really there. You know what I mean? There may be some part in the back of your head where you're like, maybe this isn't real. You know, Maybe, just maybe, they rigged the assignment. There aren't real shocks. They're playing an audio tape in the back. You know, maybe. You know, I think for the most part, the study is very convincing to people. But it's a little bit more credible. It's a little bit more uh, real. And so you're, uh, you're, you're less likely to obey authority because you know you're really doing it. Yes? Yeah. 
Well, they tended to say, no, I didn't. OK, so that's a very interesting question. They asked him after the study, you know, did you believe the study? Did you believe everything we told you? Did you think you might be killing this person? And the answer is complicated. Like, yes, you know, it was a very convincing study. People, you know, report, whoa, yeah, no, I totally thought that was freaky and real. Uh, people do tend to say, no, I didn't think I was killing the person. But it's hard to know, you know, if they just said that to not say, oh, yeah, I, I'm a murderer, you know, sorry, sorry you know. Uh, so, uh, so that part's a little bit less reliable. But people definitely reported high levels of belief in this setting, and we have good reason to think that it was very credible to subjects. But what I'm saying is maybe there's, there's a difference between 99% certain and 99.9, kind of. You know? And when the person's right there, you, know, you really think that it's real. You're sure. You know? And when there's another room, you can maybe deceive yourself a little bit. I don't know. But we have good reason to think that credibility of the study was generally high, and that's a great question. Also, empathy. A lot of research shows you empathize more with individuals uh, and, and with non-human animals as well that are close to you, that are in close proximity, close physical proximity. So empathy might be higher as the victim grows closer. Also, feelings of responsibility. We've talked a lot about like the diffusion of responsibility, right? That it's very easy. Human beings are very good at sort of saying, oh, I don't have responsibility for this situation. And when they're in the other room, yeah, sure. You know, I, I, I'm not really responsible for them. Uh, when I press this button, it, it leads indirectly to a shock in the other room. But when you're pressing their hand down on a hot plate that's, that's supposed to be this electroshock plate, you know. I mean, you know that you're responsible for doing that at a higher level. And sure enough, rates of obedience go down. Um, another thing that seems to matter is the proximity of authority. Uh, so people are, uh, okay, so they found that as the experimenter is closer, when the experimenter is right up on you, like in the film, then you tend to obey authority at a very high rate. When they leave and say, I'll call you, you know, really, I'll call, I promise. Um, and then they call and they call in the orders. In that condition, uh, uh, obedience goes way down. So, and in a couple other conditions that they ran, obedience was lower when the authority was, was further away. So they find this proximity of authority matters. Why would proximity of authority matter? Well, one is you're afraid of authority, right? You may actually be afraid that this skinny man in a white lab coat is going to try to assault you. Um, and he actually is very insistent and kind of a jerk to you, right? So it is kind of possible this guy, he's behind you, you know, like you, you kind of think maybe he might assault you. And regardless, you're sort of afraid of people in positions of power, right? You sort of assume they could do something to you. Even though he can't, people, I think, assume this. The guy in the otter shirt did not assume that. Also, uh, when people are calling in the commands, they're less uh, timely. They're less like on point, like you do the shock. And then you hear the response, and when the experimenter's right behind you, he goes, you must continue, you know? Like, just right then. He's got it all coordinated. He knows exactly what you're hearing, and he can time his next order to kind of, you know, to get in there before you doubt and start to think, oh, man, this is getting bad. Uh, whereas when it's on the phone and they're calling in the orders occasionally, or it's on a tape recording, you know, you can be like, wow, this is, this is getting really bad. That guy is screaming. I should stop doing that. You know, the timeliness the kind of the rhythm of the orders, I think, really matters. Um, also, legitimacy, the uh, appropriateness of the commands, that also seemed to matter. So when they did the study, this isn't really a proximity of authority thing. It's more legitimacy of authority. Uh, oh, no, OK. OK, well, they have conflicting evidence. In the, when they, OK, so they thought that the legitimacy of the authority figure might lead to you being more likely to obey the authority, that when it's this really legitimate source of, uh, of orders, then you'd be more likely to follow the commands. Um, and so that's why they went to run it in Bridgeport. But when they ran it in Bridgeport, there was no real difference. But in another version of the study, they had a research assistant give you the orders. The experimenter was like, I got to go. Here is my 23-year-old research assistant who will tell you to electrocute someone now. And uh, then people obeyed a lot less. So we have sort of conflicting evidence on legitimacy of authority. Um, all right, we have a minute left, but we'll end a little bit early, and then we'll uh, meet back next Tuesday as we continue learning about obedience to authority. Have a terrific weekend.